Welcome to the Art of Feminine Negotiation. I'm your host, Cindy Watson, and I am really excited to introduce you today to Frederick Bussey. And we're going to be talking about negotiating your purpose through accepting your gift. So welcome, Frederick. Hi, Cindy. Great to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, for our listeners out there, I was lucky enough to connect uh, with Frederick on Clubhouse, and he always brought such value to every room that he showed up in. Uh, He happened to mention his book, which we'll talk about a little bit later. I got the book, I loved it, and I just knew I had to bring him here to you. So for those of you who don't know Frederick, he's a business and leadership expert, author and international speaker, and he's the founder of Icon Status. But what I love is that he coaches entrepreneurs and executives to unleash the power of their gift and helps them to create extraordinary results with the uniqueness that only they can bring to the world because we all have that unique gift. We hear a lot of buzz about it. So let's dig in, Frederick. I know you had over 20 years in the music and entertainment industry. So I'd love to hear the story about how you transitioned from that career to such a successful career in business. Well, it's a heck of a journey that actually is kind of simultaneous. Uh, One kind of led to the other, which kind of led to the other, so to speak. Um, (laughs) And here's what what I mean is uh, I grew up with some uh, childhood friends and we we developed a love for music. We grew up singing in the church. Uh, Mm -hmm. I was a son of a preacher. um, And so my parents, uh, we we were past, they pastored small town churches. And so when you're in a small town church, you and your siblings become the choir. (laughs) So, <laughs> so, so we developed a love for harmony and uh, I had some mutual friends who uh, also did the same so we developed a love started a singing group um, now people call, might call them a boy band although boy bands are somewhat <laughs> defunct nowadays but um, at the time this was coming up in the era of boys to men and new edition and yeah. uh, backstreet boys and so new kids on the block. So we, you know, had, had dreams of becoming, you know, superstars and through that process of writing songs and things of that nature and pursuing music, you know, I went to college, we were still kind of pursuing that career. And these are the days when you, you know, you put together a demo tape and you wanted to pitch it around to record labels and things of that nature, but also going around and singing and doing different showcases, things like that. When you're, as I graduated from college, you know, it takes a toll on the nine to five job that you can have, right? So what I wanted to do, what I decided to do was uh, to start my own business, right? And so I didn't really know how to do that, but through a chance encounter with someone at my job, uh, I came across a commercial cleaning franchise. And so I bought a commercial cleaning franchise and that kind of introduced me to the whole world of entrepreneurship. Yeah. And uh, so eventually a year later, I left that I was doing that while pursuing a career in music. Eventually the group fell apart, but because I was doing most of the writing, it transitioned into a career actually as a songwriter and producer in the industry. So I did that for a number of years, transitioned from the business, from the creative side to the business side, where I became an artist manager. I started being a marketing director for a label for several years, transitioned from there to doing PR and publicity. I was a partner in a PR firm for several years, left there to uh, start my own marketing agency, realized that I didn't really have a passion for the marketing business, um, but I loved the business of influence and psychology and how you could help people to think better and and be better. And realized that probably from the time before when I was uh, doing music, I'd always been a coach in some regards, realized that coaching was actually a thing. Yeah. (laughs) And because I'd been an entrepreneur for 20, uh, nearly 20 years at that point, I started segueing into advising businesses and entrepreneurs and leaders in that regard. And so that's what I currently do now. Primarily, I have several other entrepreneurial ventures because I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Um, But my primary business at this point is business and leadership coaching. Yeah, I love that journey. Definitely not the traditional path, which is great and maybe gives you a unique perspective yourself because I I love your signature approach to success. And I know that you encourage entrepreneurs to take what you call an outlier approach and I'd love our perspective. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, what does that mean? What is an outlier approach and how does it work? Well, when we think about an outlier is someone who stands outside of the norm, outside the box, so to speak. And the thing is that most of us think that we have to fit ourselves into a box so that the box is the only place where we can exist. <laughs> and what I love to lead entrepreneurs to understand, or to really everyone to understand, is that there is no box, right? And so if you think of yourself as an outlier, then you give yourself permission to be outside of the box that yeah. people try to put you in, 
right? That is so and, good. <laughs> and, and that's really where we're all kind of created to be. We all, there is no box because we're all unique individuals. Every human being's DNA is different. Our makeup is different. And even if you have two people that, you know, are doppelgangers and look exactly alike, they can be completely different in their approaches, their experiences, how they filter the world. And so I just want people to learn that they can lean into their own uniqueness and that success actually lies in that path versus sitting inside the box where other people kind of designated who you should be and how you should show up in the world. Yeah. What a great reframe to get people. I, I love the way your brain works, Frederick. I got to say, it's just the analogy, that outlier. I hope you also are educating that because not only is this incredibly valuable for business owners and entrepreneurs, but boy, could they use that at high school and elementary school to get outside of that need, that desperate need to fit in. And I love when you talk about the doppelgangers, because as you were saying that, I know you've got three kids as well. We started late and had made up for lost time, had three kids in three years. And it was wow. amazing to me how three kids within a short time frame with the same parenting and the same environment, dramatically different, like just dramatically different people and personalities. So that that really resonates uh, with me. And I love that outlier perspective. And I know that helping people tell their stories in more powerful ways is a specialty of yours. And that strikes my heart as a writer myself. You know, I founded Muskoka Authors Association. I'm a big fan of storytelling and its resurgence. So tell us a little bit about uh, how you believe storytelling can help in uh, sort of elevating yourself and why it's so important. Well, stories are the ways that we first come to understand the world, right? Um, you know, when you want to explain a concept to a child, um, we have fairy tales and we have, you know, nursery rhymes and things that we do to tell stories. So we can explain concepts like kindness or being grateful or selfishness uh, or rudeness, right? Or love, right? The ultimate. And so all of these things are stories that we kind of uh, do to frame the world for people. But then our brains gravitate towards that over time. And even as we grow into adulthood, we're able to grasp con complex concepts through the simplicity of a story. All stories have similar arcs, a beginning and middle and end. There's conflict, there's resolution. And ultimately, as Joseph Campbell tells us in The Hero's Journey, that everyone sees themselves ultimately as a hero. We have a desire to be the hero. <laughs> and so when you can, through a story, bring other people in, and simplify uh, the complexity of humanity down into something that connects us all, right? Around an emotional uh, element, around the desire to succeed, the desire to win, to be connected, to be loved, to be seen and heard. Then you can allow people to live, really live their story through your story, to connect through your story. And the thing that about us is that what's funny is that our stories are all unique and yet they're all the same. Yeah. Right? <laughs> And so that's what it's funny that you can stand out by being like someone, but what it does is it connects you to so many people and you're able to build your authority, your credibility, your validity by people saying, this is a real person because I can resonate with their story. They understand that we understand the world through stories. And so leaning into and understanding your own story is your way of showing how you belong, not just among people but you belong among the, the greatest of us, right? Because we all have that ability to do that, to elevate ourselves through our story. And the last thing I'll share about that is that when you understand that you're the author of your story, mm -hmm. then it allows you to, to sit in a different space because so many people believe that, you know, their boss or their parents or their teachers or, some, uh, or the, the leader of the country is, is the author of their story. And so when we sit in that place, it kind of restricts us yeah. because now someone else is in charge of all the, the, the plot and, and the character development. And so we don't realize that we have the ability to write our own ending, you know, even now. Yeah so much buried in there. And I, I just want to put a pin in a couple of those for our listeners, our viewers out there, because I think that was super powerful. The idea about stories is connection, because let's face it, I mean, whether you're elevating your business, whether it's in your personal or professional life, having that connection is critical, building those relationships and using stories to do that. What a powerful lesson. And I loved when you talk about um, this fact that we're all unique 
and yet universal, our stories, right? Our stories are unique and yet there it's the universality of the stories that's gonna help us make that connection. I thought that was a really powerful point that deserved putting a pin in and owning your own story. My gosh, we all tell ourselves stories and we can either allow that negative inner critic to keep chirping. We can blame mm-hmm. our past circumstances. You know, that's something I've been doing a lot of work on recently as well. I and mean, we can use those stories we tell ourselves about our past or this happened or that wasn't fair and let that define us. And man, is it transformational when you own your story and recognize you can choose your story and reframe your story. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. So as you know, I loved your book, Breaking Orbit, uh, and we're going to make sure to put that in the show notes as well for everybody, give you a link to be able to check out that book. And I highly rececommend you check it out. It was a transformational book. And I was particularly intrigued. You have such unique perspectives on so many things. And one of those that really caught my attention was your unique perspective on purpose. And I'd love, we hear a lot of stuff about purpose today, but I'd love if you could share how you draw distinctions between purpose and mission, you know, purpose versus passion, purpose mm-hmm. versus your gift, because so often people conflate all of those into one big pile these days. So I'd love for you to share the distinctions that you draw on that. I thought it was really powerful. Okay, great. Um, well, first of all, uh, I'm really glad that you enjoyed the book. And um, I love the fact that you've read it, and you've drawn so many things out of it. So um, it's great to be able to have this dialogue about it. Sometimes when you're writing a book, you know, it's kind of in your own head, until you're, yeah. you're imagining what people are going to be experiencing, but it's great to be able to hear those reflections. Um, when it t- comes to purpose, so for a little bit of context, the book Breaking Orbit is about how people can discover their gift, their unique capacity to impact the world in a very specific and powerful way. Um, and so we, we use a lot of language that overlaps in many different ways. And so what it does is it makes our understanding of a concept kind of fuzzy. And so what I wanted to do was kind of sharpen the distinctions between different things. Uh, one of the things that uh, I talk about in the book is the fact that your gift um, is, your, is innate, right? You're created with your gift. And that's a powerful thing to understand because it means that you are created with a purpose. And uh, if you've ever read the, the Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, right? It was a, it's a, a powerful book. It transformed so many people's lives, including my own. But one of the things that I kind of came to discover through this, um, through the writing of this book was that our understanding of purpose is a little bit slanted. Yeah. And it's this, right? It is that we believe that we have to find a purpose or that we have to go out and create one because we feel like we're without, right? It's kind of a void. So people are always kind of seeking that. But if you think about it, right, everything in our world, in our physical universe was created with a purpose. So the couch that you have, the (laughs) the picture frames, right? This microphone that I'm speaking into, everything was created by a maker for a particular purpose, and so if that thing fails to use to be used for the proper purpose that it was created for, it's never going to function in the same way. So yes, you could use your scarf as a door handle, right? To close the door. <laughs> you could, but it, but it fulfills its purpose when it is adorning you as it do, is doing so lovely right now, right? <laughs> and, but the, the problem that human beings have is that we believe that we were created without purpose and we have to go find and create one. And what that means is that we are drifting and we are not fully aligned with the power that we have within us, right? We're not living into that power. We're not showing up powerfully. And in many cases, we come to certain addictions or ways of medicating ourselves yeah. Because we feel this emptiness and we don't, we can't explain it. We don't understand what it is. And we're always searching for that. But how powerful could we be if from the time that we were born, we realized not only do I have a gift, but my gift has a purpose. And all I have to do in this world to matter, to be significant, to be impactful is to live into that gift. And so when you're, when you're, whether you're an entrepreneur, an employer, a doctor, a parent, we all have a, a gift and a purpose to live into. And we, when we're aligned with that, it makes everything that we do so much more meaningful. And it's fun when you're talking about that purpose piece, um, if I can, I want to share, there is one gorgeous quote, and I, I hope I don't bastardize it on you here, Frederick, but you have this gorgeous quote when you talk about 
um, using our gift for its intended purpose. I love that section. And you talk about, you likened it, I think, to trying to use water to light a dark room or trying to drink the wind and how that'll just make us thirstier. I just thought that was so gorgeous. So, and wanted to share that with our listeners here. And I will say the book is so, I, I was going to say poetic, but people may misinterpret. It's so beautifully written. Let me put it that way. Not only are there incredible insights, but it's beautifully written. And so then going back, if you can talk to us a bit, that was gorgeous description about sort of purpose. And I think you're right. And I was guilty of that as well. I think your book gave me this real reframe about how, you know, go discover your purpose and everybody's on this quest or this mission, as opposed mm -hmm. to recognize that you've already got a gift. And when you use it for its intended purpose, you're going to be more on purpose. But I'd love if you could chat quickly quickly about that difference between sort of purpose and mission, purpose and passion. And you beautifully talked about the difference between purpose and gift already, but just how you draw these great distinctions between purpose and mission and purpose and passion as well. That's worth sharing. Yeah. Um, I think it's pretty simple. So purpose is why you were created, but your mission can be a thing that you are out to accomplish, right? But missions can change. And so a lot of times when we conflate purpose and mission, we think that our mission in life is to do this thing, right? And your gift is not about the thing that you do. It is about the impact that you create. So I liken it to a, a drill, the difference between a drill and a sledgehammer, right? And I talk about this elsewhere in the book, but I'll use that example here because I think it makes a good point. When you, when you have a mission to hang a picture on a wall, you need to make a hole. So you would use a drill and not a sledgehammer, right? <laughs> you hope. <laughs> you, you would hope. So, so well, so let me let me narrow this down. So your mission is is specific, right? It can be time based. It can be location based. It is for a finite time. Sometimes what we do is we try to apply our purpose to a mission and vice versa, right? And so your life, so if you are kind to apply something that is meant to be finite to something that is everlasting, and when I say everlasting, it's from the time you're born to the time that you expire on this earth, right? You have a purpose to fulfill. But if you make that into a mission and it is finite, then when it expires, now you're lost again mm. because you confuse the two things. Yeah. A mission, you can have multiple missions in life. What you understand is that on each mission, I am able to impact it. Uh, I'm able to impact the world in a very powerful way specifically so that you make sure that you are creating the most impact. Um, I love James Bond movies, for instance, right? Yeah. <laughs> in James Bond, there is a mission that the team must accomplish, but each member of the team, 007, um, Q, who uh, handles the gadgets, M, yeah. who runs the team, everybody has a role to play. So their purpose um, supersedes the mission, right? M is always going to be the leader. 007 is always going to be the super agent, right? But they can fulfill their, me their, their purpose because they understand that this is the impact that I can have. And they don't conflate the mission with the purpose and the purpose with the mission. Yeah. Is that hopefully that's 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 clear. That is so good. Your analogies are just so darn apt all the time. And as you were speaking, I think it's and again, I just want to really put a pin in this for our listeners. Yeah, I think it explains why so many people go through life, A, first in search of that purpose. And then even when they feel they've discovered it, I think you're right. They often conflate it with the mission and then they do something they achieve something. And I think it's why so many people today are really suffer from depression because they're like, mm -hmm. now what? They suddenly, they've achieved something and they have that massive, well, now what? And they feel like they're completely unfulfilled and lost again. So I think that your distinction, and that's why I really wanted you to dig in on that, that distinction between mission and purpose is just so important. Um, I just love that. And on that, if you can also take us down the path, because I know you've got, and you already touched on it, I think, Frederick, but like you have a really unique approach to our unique gifts and how people can tap into it. So if you can sort of take us through that, maybe start with the three types of giftedness, which I also mm -hmm. thought was, well, I don't know if that's completely original, but I thought that was brilliant, that transformers, translators, and transistors, if you can dig into that for us. Yeah, yeah. So, well, well, so the thing about it was when I was writing the book, I was thinking, well, there's 8 billion people in the world. And if everybody's gift is unique, then how am I supposed to be able to tell 8 billion people, you know, that, that, you know, find your gift. Yeah. But what it came down to was 
when I looked at the definition of giftedness that I, I actually, I borrowed that definition from Miles Monroe, Dr. Miles Monroe. And um, it made a lot of sense, but then you started thinking about it in terms of power, right? You really are born with this power, but power is often deployed in different ways, right? And so I came up with these three categories because they roughly translate to how power, how we manifest that power in our own lives, okay. right? <laughs> so you have transformers and transformers are like a power source, almost like a power generator in and of themselves, right? Um, but they are unique because they are able, to, these are the people who are, whose gift is being able to take something and create something out of nothing. So you think about it, typically we think of them as artists or um, um, uh, musicians or what we call creatives, yeah. right? They're either able to take something and make it out of nothing or to take it and transform it from one form to another, right? And so we're often amazed because like, how do they see this, this, um, this art piece out of a blank canvas? Yeah. Like, how do they see this picture or whatever the case may be, right? But it doesn't mean that it only exists in quote unquote creative elements. It could be a scientist, you know, yeah. you could be an accountant you can, and just be able to see numbers and be able to create a different type of world in that way. So those are transformers. Translators are ones who are able to, to translate meaning, right? So they're able to take the complex ideas or the, the elusive thoughts or, or, or experiences that we have in life, and they're able to translate it into something that is significant and meaningful for us. These people help us to understand our world better to understand our lives better and to understand our purpose better, right? And so to be how we can move and be more powerful, be more efficient, be more effective in our lives. And then we have transistors. Transistors are people who are just have that innate ability to make everyone or any situation around them better. So we often call those like people like the, 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 the life of the party, right? When they yeah. come in, their energy transforms their environment. And so they're able to make other people better in their own gift to make other situations or organizations better simply by their presence and their own insights that are, that are related to their gift. Yeah. Such a great, again, such a great analogy and also the imagery of it. And I love how you're able to tie it with power, those layers deeper. It's funny, we're talking about power in Clubhouse this week. It's sort of our theme for the rooms this week. Um, and as I was reading that section of your book, I, I'm thinking of people that I know that fit into that, like people who exhibit power and have done great things and how they fit into each of those categories. And if I can ask, Frederick, where do you fit? Are you a transformer, a translator or a transistor? I'm a translator. Um, I find that it, it, what, what is, I think was helpful for me and I think is helpful for a lot of people as they're going through this process of discovering where they fit, right, is to kind of look back and see times in your life and places where you've had the greatest impact and where it was effortless for you, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we think of finding our purpose as this thing that's really, really hard we have to grind down. But in actuality, because it's innate in us, it is not something that is foreign to us. It's just invisible to us because it's so easy for us to do it that we don't value it that much, right? We often equate value with things that are come from struggle and a lot of effort. And so if, if, we, if I was a bird and I thought that struggle was necessary, then I might think that you know, um, uh, pushing, pushing a, a, a cart uphill would be something that would make me significant yeah. instead of valuing my own wings and my ability to soar because okay. I can do that without effort. Right. Yeah. So that's so perfect. Oh my gosh. And I love that little distinction that you gave right now. Cause it helped as I was reading the book, I was thinking, well, I definitely do some of that and I do some of this and I do some of it. But when you just talked about the one that comes the most effortlessly, just totally clicked into place for me. And I, I can really see as well, like even within the legal um, career, having, having practiced social justice law for 30 years as well, I think some of the most effective lawyers are people who can show up who are translators because they're able mm -hmm. to take those complex concepts and parse them into a way that's easy to understand. That's really grand. And that's why I think that's probably why I'm so attracted to your analogies as well, because you do take these crazy complex concepts and able to bring them into really meaningful. In it. And on that, I wasn't going to go here, but if you want to just share the comments you made about the oak tree as well, I guess, speaking of translating, I thought that was Again, such a brilliant message at any point in life, but also especially for kids at that age when they just feel like they need to be like everybody else or feeling like that little nut. If you can just share your analogy about this, the acorn and the oak tree, I think it's oh, helpful. 
Yeah, the, I was thinking about this as I was writing the book. Um, just the fact that, um, and this is actually I, I was I was in the process of finishing it, and I actually had some people uh, ask me to speak, uh, actually uh, to preach a sermon at a church, and so I gave a talk about this, and I was talking about the fact that a lot of people believe that because they have they have gotten older, right, and that that maybe they haven't tapped into that that gift or their their purpose, that they feel like they wasted their life, and. And there are also conversely, there are young people who feel like because they haven't accomplished anything or they don't know what that purpose is for themselves, that they can't really figure out what that is. But the, the analogy that I use is that, you know, inside every acorn is an oak tree. Hmm. It's always been there. And all it needs to do is be planted and in the proper soil and it'll flourish, right? That oak tree was always in, in the acorn. It was always there. And it's, it's, it's always every element that it needs to be successful, to, to flourish, to be powerful in its own right, already exists in it from the time that it drops from, from the original oak tree. Yeah, so beautiful. And especially that little piece when you talk about if you're lying there on the ground and you just feel like you're like all these other nuts, these acorns around you you, uh, all you have to do is tap into that realization that put yourself in the right circumstances and allow yourself to get those roots. And you're going to become a unique, incredible oak tree. I thought that was just a beautiful illustration. Um, and I would love it if you could share with us your keys to discovering your gift. And again, I don't know if you have time to go through all nine, uh, but whatever, at the very least, if you can give some of your top keys or, or how people, because I do think there's so much written on this, but I think a lot of the current sort of writing on the issue does conflate purpose with gift and does conflate mission with purpose. So I'd love if you could share some of your keys to how people can discover that unique gift that they have. Yes, um, there are, well, like you said, there are nine keys that I, I use in the book to talk about discovering your gift. And it's a journey. Um, and one of the things that that I love to talk about um, is the fact that the first key is forgiveness, right? And the reason why I, I talk about forgiveness in the book is because so many people are blocked from stepping into their gift because of resentment that they're holding against others wow. or against themselves, right? Okay. And our gifts are not given to us for us, right? We benefit from using them, right? We, we find fulfillment and meaning and significance in our lives from walking in our gifts, but they are meant to serve the world because they are given for a bigger purpose above ourselves. That's why so many of us are seeking something that's bigger, but imagine trying to seek a bigger vision, a bigger purpose, a bigger living out of yourself. And yet you're holding something against someone else, someone, someone, uh, or other people, or holding it against yourself, feeling like you can never forgive yourself for some past transgression, something that you did years gone by that, that really haunts you. And so when you release yourself from that, it, it releases a blockade of, of, of energy and the flow of, of your, your own genius, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm a business guy, so I love to talk in very specific terms, but at the same time, sometimes it feels like, well, you know, we use these we use these, uh, I don't call them superficial, but we use these other terms that kind of sound woo-woo, yeah. but they actually explain very specific things. Like we, like we say, I feel stuck or things are just blocked right now. Yeah. Can't really get, you know, can't really get going because we can't pin down what's in the way. And very often those things from a personal standpoint are the inability to forgive others or forgive ourselves. Yeah. So I talk about forgiveness. I talk about, um, I talk about detail, attention to detail. I love that one because it's one that we overlook as well. A lot of times we are, as children, we're fascinated with the tiniest little things, the most, the weirdest little things. <laughs> and um, we notice things about the world that other people simply don't see. And it's because it's connected to our gift. The problem is that if if our environment, our teachers, our parents do not value the way that we see the world and want to put us again into that box, into this narrow lane of discovery, then we, we lose that capacity over time to really tap into that, right? And so when we, when we learn to value the way that we see the world, the, 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 
the microscopic minutia that that fascinates us, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you are a fabric maker and you love the way that things feel, yeah. or you're, uh, you're you're a basketball player and you love the the way that you can organize people in a way to get the most efficiency out of a game, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, right? It's not about the thing that you do per se, but it is a clue. The details that we are, are fascinated by are a clue into our own genius, our own gift, and the way that we are meant to elevate the world around us, if you will. Yeah, so good. And I, I really want to circle back to this idea about service because, and I don't know what your thoughts are, Frederick. I'd be interested in your thoughts on the impact because I've seen even difference in my lifestyle from the kind of shows that I would watch as a kid where, you know, the good guy always won, your word was your bond. There were certain, but, and now uh, everything seems to, maybe it's just a sign I'm getting old, but there seems to be such a focus now on me, right? What can I get? How do I get ahead? Uh, the ends justifying the means, right? I mean, we tend to be glorifying the, the so-called bad guys. They've become the protagonist in most of the major shows now. So I love that you speak about the importance of, you know, using our purpose and our gifts um, in service of others and in doing that. And I think people often assume that means that we're giving up something, but that recognition that when you come from a place of service, when you come from that mindset, you can achieve more, not only for others, but it's a gorgeous way that it actually uplifts and fulfills you as well. I'd, I'd love your perspective on that. Well, I think I think the shift that we're seeing is that yeah, we see it politically, we see it economically, people feel helpless, they feel powerless. And so they are attracted in those times to those figures that can articulate that power that they don't feel right. So we're drawn to that. What makes this guy so powerful? How is he able or how is she able to excel in the midst of all these circumstances? We, we're searching for that, leaning into that. And there's an element of truth to that in that Often the bad guy is free of all the other bounds of society <laughs> to only pursue what, what their, their ultimate aims are, right? They are seeking validation, but they are willing to go outside the bounds of the law or whatever, or, or, or ethics to be able to do that. The flip side of that, though, when it comes to giftedness, is that when we understand that originally we have unlimited power within ourselves, right? When we understand that and we know how to harness it, right? To simply learn how to just be, not to have to do, right? And not on other people's terms. It doesn't mean that we are lawless, but we understand that there are universal laws that are always at work inside of us that we are just not tapping into. We're actually working counter to our own nature when we're doing that. And when we, benevolence and, and, and service to others actually makes us bigger. Yeah. We're able to accomplish more, you know, versus what, if you're only chasing something for yourself, you have to fight the entire world yeah. to get them on your page, right? Yeah. And so you find that the super villains are the ones that have to always steal something and hold the world hostage to get what they want, yeah. right? <laughs> Whereas the, the hero can always harness the entire world to be on his side because he's fighting for us and therefore we are fighting with him, right? Or with her. And that is what your gift allows it allows you to do because if we're all operating in our gift, now we're all working in synergy and harmony. And that is what the universe is about. It's about how gravity works and galaxies work and, and gravity works with, with oxygen and air and water and all those things. It, it, that's, our world is built to survive that way, to thrive that way. And so are we, if we learn how to just recognize that and accept it for ourselves. Gets me all tingly thinking about the potential. Imagine a world where everybody showed up with that kind of perspective shift. So powerful. And, and I think it's worth coming back. You touched on about people feeling overwhelmed right now or, or sort of mm -hmm. impotent to be able to make change. And, and if you could share your dirty money analogy, because I thought that's probably a beautiful sort of analogy to help people step into that idea about recognizing it doesn't matter what condition you feel that you're in right now, where people stop feeling that they're, they have worth anymore. And I thought your mm -hmm. dirty money analogy is a really beautiful illustration of how our purpose and our gift is always there and how we can always tap into it, no matter what condition we find ourselves in. If you share that for us. Oh yeah. Well, so that's simply, imagine that you were walking, you know, maybe in the middle of the night, late at night, and um, you have to duck down an alley and it's raining and it's, you know, cold and blustery or whatever. And you see something that's kind of stuck maybe to the corner of a wall or whatever. And you look down and you see that it's a piece of paper fluttering. And you pick it up 
because it looks like it's money and you realize <laughs> that you're right. But not only is it money, it's a million dollar bill, right? But it's tattered and it's muddy and it's been discarded by someone for some reason, right? Now, I don't even know if there is a million dollar bill, but just let's, <laughs> let, let, let's, let's stay with the story for a second. It. it works well. <laughs> but, the, but it's a million dollar bill, right? And despite its condition, its value is not based on its appearance. Its value is not based on its position, right? So it doesn't have to be in a wall or uh, it doesn't have to be in a, in a shiny case or in a bank or, or being held by a very beautiful person, right? Its value is innate. Its value is printed within it and the, its capacity to be able to purchase things, life, whatever you, you might want is innate in it. And so a lot of us are like that we're all like that million dollar bill. And many of us feel as though we are been cast aside, that we've been, you know, stomped on and torn and tattered and damaged. And internally we feel that trauma and we feel that we have been devalued. And what I want the world to know, I want people to understand is that your value is not tied to your appearance or your position or your experience. What people have treated you as or how they have viewed you is not at all who you are. Yeah. Your value is innate inside you is that gift and your infinite capacity to impact the world as only you can do right the the light that you can create is is innate within you and you can harness that power and you don't have to listen to all the other stories all the other things that people have told you about who you're supposed to be or who they think you are or what you're capable of you have infinite value as an individual and as a human being Mm, so gorgeous. So resonated. I, I mean, as you know, I've been sharing that dirty money with everybody. I, even, I actually read the, it out at the dinner table the other night to our, to our three kids as well. And they, wow. uh, yeah. And they, and because, and it resonated with them in a way that had I preached about the principle behind it, they wouldn't have gotten the same way. So it was, mm. uh, it was great to see. Um, and I'd love to transition a little bit now in terms of using some of the things that you've talked about, like that ability to be able to find your purpose and uh, coming from a place of service and tapping into that unique gift that you have. How does any of that translate in terms of negotiations, taking uh, you know, a more collaborative approach to negotiations, for example? How do some of the messages that you teach show up uh, to make you a more effective negotiator, Frederick? Well, that's a great question. When I think about negotiation, <clears throat> and you know, we've been in these rooms and clubhouse where we discuss this quite a bit, the different aspects of it, really. But negotiation, in essence, is kind of what we do in life in so many different ways. You know, Chris Voss talks about this in, in his, his famous book, where um, he talks about the fact that we're always negotiating in different ways, whether it's negotiating traffic or negotiating a line in the supermarket or whatever the case may be. And then we have higher level negotiations where we are trying to extract a deal or uh, better terms in terms of a, um, a job or things like that nature, right? Whatever you're trying to negotiate, you are either, it is a transactional in nature. You are, we are typically taught we have to give up something to get something. But in terms of your giftedness, many times the things that we are negotiating for, we are negotiating from actually from a pace, place of powerlessness or a feeling of helplessness, right? And so we feel like we have to beat the other person down in order to get what we want, right? We have to, you know, wrangle out this deal and it really has to be that when in essence, you understand that you can serve others in a negotiation, that they can actually get what they want and you can get what you want, but, and it, and it can serve both, both sides of the table. But if we are, and when we start to negotiate from a position of power, which is what giftedness really is, we understand we have infinite power. I don't come to the table in need of anything per se, not personally, right? I'm not in a place of lack or scarcity. I am infinitely able to, to, to fill all my needs. And I know that my unique gift set or giftedness allows me to be able to serve you at a high level as well. So now I'm more generous, you know, in my, in my demeanor, which makes us, it builds rapport. It allows us to be uh, more connected. And you can sense that too, that now it is a collaborative approach, as you said, we're both out to achieve this thing that is between us, that we can both create together instead of you winning and me losing or me winning and you losing, right? Yeah. 
So perfect. And, and really at the heart of what you just said, that so resonated with me. I think people believe that when they come from a collaborative mindset, when they come from a place of service, that they're showing up from a place of weakness when the opposite is true, that's coming from the ultimate place of power. I think that's a really important mindset shift for people and drawing that distinction between I think part of the resistance to that is we've been so conditioned to see power as exerting power over people, mm -hmm. whereas what you describe is bringing that inner power to have power with people, right? So right. really- It's, it's the difference between power and force, yes. right? And you have to use force when you when you have to generate, you're, you're trying to um, to move someone else off of their, off of their rocker, if you will. Yeah. But when you have power, right? Power- can not only be about movement, but it also can be about creation, right? And so that's the difference between collaboration and compromise. Compromise is when each of you have to give up something, but collaboration is when you build something together, something that is unique uh, to both of you that both people win. Yeah, so good, so good. And what would you say, what do you see as the key reasons why most negotiations fail in your view, Frederick? Oh, I think that's it's largely rooted in that, right? Um, a lot of it has to do with ego. It's the reason why, you know, um, so last year I, I launched an M&A group. And so I've been learning a lot about that process. And, and, and any any deal, the real reason why it falls apart is because of people's ego. Yeah. You know, sometimes people would rather see you lose yes. even more oh. than they want to win. Yeah. And so they know if you want it, if you want it bad enough and they can't get what they want, they'll blow up a deal, right? Oh. Yeah. So- if, if we want to win a negotiation, um, whether you are negotiating for a job, a salary, um, you're buying a business or you're buying a home, right? Yeah. Understand that you, you are, that's why the collaborative process is so, much, is so important because you have to understand what the other person is really out to get and understand the internal motivations that are lying under the surface because people can tell you that they want something, yeah. but, not be that, but they want it for a reason, right? Yeah. And understanding the thing behind the thing is so much more valuable because then you can help them to get to what they really want and you achieve a level of satisfaction that they didn't even know was possible sometimes. Yeah, it's so true. Those better outcomes that are unanticipated. And it's fun when you say that, it really struck me about that people would sometimes rather um, see you not win, even if it's to their uh, detriment. There was, and I'm going to have to dig in and find that there was a really interesting study on that, Frederick, out of, I can't remember if it was Northwestern University, but where they actually did a, a comprehensive study of people where if you could, they had to choose between if you could make X amount of money that was more than enough money to meet all of your needs, but was less money than your peers or your neighbors, mm -hmm. would you choose that? Or would you make uh, money that wasn't enough to meet all of your needs, but was more than your peers? And in overwhelming numbers, more a stunning number of people chose that they would actually take the money that didn't even meet their needs if it meant that compared to others, they made more money. It was just mind boggling. Yeah, and I can't I, I've, I've heard that story, yes. Go yeah, ahead. I've, heard that, I've heard that study, yes. And it, it is fascinating to me, but I, I think again, because it comes from that place of neediness, that feeling of powerlessness, right? And so it becomes relational or comparative, right? I am not fully powerful in myself, but I'm more powerful than you, which makes me feel better about myself. So we're medicating our helplessness with that comparisonism, so to speak. So yeah, it's fascinating. So beautiful. And that really ties to that internal versus external value. When we're seeking those comparisons, when we're looking to get our sense of value from others, as mm -hmm. opposed to following your process, tapping into your unique gift, using it to fulfill your purpose. And the power that comes from that allows you to feel absolutely internally grounded in your own sense of value all the time. Has that been your experience in your teachings? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. I think what it does is it, it frees people up. Uh, and you're able to create more possibilities. A lot of times we can't see all the possibilities that lie out there because we're so narrowed in on this is the thing that I need to feel validated. You Absolutely. know, it, it can be a number, a job, it can be a relationship, whatever the case may be. And the fact of the matter is that there's infinite possibilities if you're open to it. And if you know that you have the ability to create infinite possibilities um, and you understand the other side of it, which is that that's okay. Yeah. I remember I was when I was writing the book and I was kind of sharing these thoughts with my wife and she said that's terrifying like to, <laughs> to be able to, to be able to do anything that you want 
Can we teach kids that when they're young, yeah. it's great. You can be anything you want to be. And then when you're an adult, being anything you want to be is terrifying. Like, no, I just need an answer. Yeah. So yeah, I, I do notice that very much so. Yeah, well, and I'm glad you touched on that. That's a really important point to recognize because if people do as they start this process, if it scares them, that's okay. <laughs> you know, I think that's such a great reminder. And I can't believe you've given us such incredible, valuable nuggets here. Can you share with us one more key to helping to discover your gift? I know you talked about forgiveness and you gave us a little, little teasers. Can you share one other key that you'd like to leave us with in helping people? And definitely go read the book. You can get all nine of the keys to discovering your book, I highly recommend Breaking Orbit. And as I say, we'll leave that in the show notes. But if you want to share one more uh, little nugget with us on that. One that I love is uh, the fact that often the key to discovering your gift is hidden in your pet peeves, yeah. the things that really rankle you about the world, right? And you'll notice that some people just they'll go start raving mad about the weirdest things or whatever, right? But often the reason why that bothers you so much is because your gift is the key to being able to solve that problem, right? To be able to ease that suffering or that pain. Mm -hmm. And if we often give ourselves permission to be able to do that, right? Whether it's inventing a new product, whether it's starting a nonprofit organization, whether it's simply volunteering or just raising your hand and saying, I can help with that. When you, are, when you recognize that that is a key, then you can lean into it even more, right? And so all that, the, the entire process of going through the nine keys has helped to kind of give you the complexity or the different layers to unpacking that. And you don't also, you know, we talked a lot about powerlessness and helplessness, the sense of helplessness that people feel. When you understand that your gift is the key to unlocking that thing, it, it puts you in a different position with your world itself, right? You no longer feel as if I am at the mercy of this thing that drives me crazy right? No, now I know that I am activated to be able to wipe it off the face of the earth, to shift this whole narrative, whatever the case may be. And so you are actually able to, to become a bigger, more powerful version of yourself, not a shrinking violet, not collapsing in a fetal position, not uh, um, a, a drug addict or an alcoholic, because you can't cope with whatever that thing is that's going on in your life or what you're seeing out there in the world. Yeah. So good. And what a great note to end on as well on that, because it ties back to so many of the themes we've talked about here today in terms of feeling that powerlessness, feeling the need to compare, and how when you show up from this place, you're able to actually come from such a more powerful place. So now I normally love to end with asking what's one of the greatest mindset shifts that you've ever had in your life, Frederick. And again, it doesn't have to be tied to this issue, it can be personal or professional, but just one of those moments where you had a shift that was like a real aha for you. Mm. So there, I've, I've been on a journey over these past several years that I've learned so many different things that are powerful. It would be hard for me to pick one. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to cheat and use my book because um, I think that it was one of the foundations for me being able to go on this next level of discovery for myself. Nice. The thing about a gift, and when I, when I teach this to people, I, I tell them, this is the most important thing that you'll ever learn. And it sounds like a, it sounds like an outlandish boast. But the reason why is because everything that we do is really rooted in our belief about who we are and our relationship to the world. And if you believe that you have infinite value, you believe that you have infinite capacity to influence the world in a way that only you could do it, how much differently would you behave? Yeah. And for me, the shift was recognizing that I don't have to do a thing to be meaningful. All I have to do is be, be myself yes. and that is my only job. My only job every day is to show up in my gift every single day, right? And if I have that, that purpose in mind and I'm moving it with that intention in the world, then what happens is my gift creates more opportunities for me to do that at a higher and higher level. It is a principle of momentum, if you will. Yeah. Because once you start that snowball rolling down the hill, it continues to pick up more and more steam, more and more snow. That snowball turns into an avalanche. And that is what creates, that's what we feel in our own lives. If you, you, if you feel stuck, if you feel like you don't have the capacity to be able to affect anything around you in your environment, discovering your gift 
is the effortless way that you can do that. And then when you are walking in the gift every day, you will find more and more ways that you can impact the world and you'll see how you will expand as an individual. So that's something that's been really powerful for me. And I've noticed it because, you know, when I started talking about this concept, you know, it opened up opportunities to have more conversations, to be in more podcasts, to be in more rooms. And um, I don't always have to talk about giftedness to walk in my gift. I walk in my gift and it creates more opportunities to talk about this so other people can now be able to get to navigate that experience for themselves. So powerful. What a great note to end on as well. I love that about just the power of giving yourself permission to be you (laughs) in all your infinite uh, capacity. I think that's gorgeous. Well, Frederick, this has been fantastic. I I just loved every moment of what you've shared here. I really invite for all our listeners out there. This is one of those episodes. Re-listen to this. This is like over and over again. Embody it, become it. Um, You will get more and more gold nuggets from this, I think, every time that you listen and let it sink in a different level. And then later, as you start to grow, listen to it again, you'll be able to take more as you get to a different place. So thank you so much for being here, Frederick. This has been fantastic. It's been my honor. Thank you so much, Cindy, for having me. And for everybody out there, I really invite you to go, if you want to learn more about Frederick, uh, definitely check out check out on Facebook at frederickbussey.7. Uh, he's got a Facebook group as well at the Seven Figure Circle. Uh, check him out at on Instagram under Frederick Bussey or Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, and please make sure to go grab a copy of his book, Breaking Orbit as well, which as I say, we'll make sure to put that link in the show notes for you. And I am sure that you, if you've been listening at all, you got tons of value from this episode that you're going to be able to apply both personally and professionally across the spectrum. And make sure if you haven't already subscribed, make sure to subscribe to the podcast and share with anyone that you think could get some value. Definitely share this episode, share the podcast. Uh, I think it helps to empower people to step into the best version of themselves. And make sure to join our Women on Purpose community if you haven't done that as well. And I'll make sure to put that in the show notes on Facebook. And that is a wrap for this episode. So until next time, I invite you to go forth and negotiate your best life on your terms so that you can stop missing out and start getting more of what you want and deserve from the boardroom to the bedroom. Take care.